Pizansky. And I'm Shiloh Hammerlin. And welcome to The Transcript. This week, The Transcript dives into the Northampton mayoral election, investigates a Facebook whistleblower, and explores art in the orchard. United States coronavirus vaccination rates have jumped by more than 20 percentage points since numerous businesses, hospital systems, social institutions, and government entities adopted vaccine requirements, the Biden administration said Wednesday. 77% of eligible Americans now have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. In other news, inflation in the United States sped up in September, reaching its highest rate in more than a decade as the coronavirus pandemic continued to cause labor and material shortages. The Labor Department reported Wednesday that the Consumer Price Index jumped by 5.4% from er a year earlier, slightly higher than in August and the same rate seen in June and July as the economy reopened. I'm Shiloh Hammerland, and thank you for watching. Y'all ready for this? With the fall soccer season heading into the final stretch, playoff season is almost upon us. The boys' soccer team has been having an outstanding season so far with a record of nine wins and two losses and clinched a spot in the playoffs. At 4-4-4, four, four, and four, the girls look to finish the season strong. This week, we interviewed the team captains to ask them how they plan on ending their season strong. As captains, what do you attribute your recent success to? Um, I'd attribute our recent success to, uh, you know, the new coaching, st coaching staff coming in, uh, helping the program, keeping the hardworking mentality, and um, kids coming to weekend practices, putting extra work in when they don't need to, you know, practices that aren't mandated and just getting the weekend work in. What are your hopes for the postseason? Uh, our hopes for the postseason is uh, to go as far as possible. Uh, there's two tournaments this year, so we're trying to qualify for both. We've already qualified for the state tournament, but we're trying to get to the Western Mass tournament. But we wanna, we have the team to do it this year, so we just want to go as far as possible and uh, do something that uh, no team has done in a um, Northampton soccer history in a while. I'm here with two members of the girls' varsity soccer team. How has your season been so far? It's been pretty good so far. We've had some ups and downs, but right now we're doing pretty well. Um, it's definitely been a lot better than our past previous two seasons, so I'd say it's been a good season. What's your record? <laughs> uh, five, four, and four, I believe. Um, if any, what is your postseason going to look like? Well, if we win one more of our next four games, then we qualify for the state tournament, I think, and play Holyoke today, so should be yeah, should be a good game. Should be. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Make sure to tune in next week. Last Thursday, legislation unanimously passed the Massachusetts Senate allowing for the usage of X as a gender on certain ID forms, such as birth certificates and driver's licenses. The bill, which was sponsored by State Senator Joe Comerford, aims to allow people to own their self-identity. We spoke with the students and teachers on how they feel about this bill. I feel like it's really important to have a gender neutral option on these kinds of important forms. I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. I think it's really important for non-binary people to be able to express their gender identity on just simple you know, documents and stuff like that. I think it makes them feel just a little bit more valid in their identity and more accepted by just society as a whole. There are certainly more steps forward that need to be taken. But I think that this is a really great start, and I think that it's really important for people to be able to feel represented. People deserve to be represented the way that they want to be represented. I personally have had that right for a while now, but I know some of my friends haven't, and I really feel for them because I know what it's like to feel different from other people. So what prompted me to file the non-binary gender marker uh, legislation um, was constituents. Constituents, while I was running uh, for my first election, talked to me about the fact that Massachusetts um, was not a state where people who identified as non-binary um, would have the option to have an X marker on documents like licenses. Among the most vocal and most powerful advocates for this bill were young people. Um, basically saying to me, hey, wake up, this is a new world. Um, we don't fit in these boxes. Um, these boxes are rigid, they're old, they're archaic, they're dusty. <laughs> you know, get out of our way, basically, legislature. Don't make us 
um, fit in a world that you grew up in. Um, and, and, and that's the power of constituents to push someone like me to consider this bill a priority. When it passed the Senate, this time it was a unanimous vote. That doesn't happen all the time. In fact, it, it, it happens shockingly few times in a session, but that means every single Senator heard from their constituents. And I bet you they were the majority of them were young people. And so when that bill came and I asked everybody to vote on it, it it's through my floor speech and everybody said yes to that bill, that was a testament to the power of advocacy. And I would think young people driven advocacy. With every single passage, we grow to be a more inclusive and just place where everybody can thrive. And that's the, I think that should be the goal of the legislature is to create a commonwealth where everybody is seen, everybody is valued, everybody has a place to thrive. Massachusetts has become one of the over 20 states to give a gender X option on identification with more potentially to follow in the upcoming years. See you next week. On Sunday, October 3rd, a former Facebook employee who had leaked international documents from Facebook and Instagram came forward revealing herself as Frances Hugan. Though an interview with 60 Minutes after revealing her identity, she talked about how the social media platforms have been making choices knowing they would be harmful to the public, but beneficial for them. She stated there were conflicts of interest between what was good for the public and what was good for the Facebook. And Facebook over and over again chose to optimize for its own interest. She further elaborated on these claims that Facebook had stopped silencing misinformation after the 2020 election in order to generate more revenue view, ultimately leading to Facebook to be a main facilitator of events of January 6th. She also claims that, that on Instagram, continue to push content that was damaging to teens knowing the harm it was causing surrounding the body image and diet culture. We asked NHS students about their thoughts and concerns about this situation. I think that social media, like Instagram, can affect um, people's mental health because people post like the best parts of their life. They wouldn't post like the bad parts of their life. So watching that and seeing that can make you feel like you're missing out or like your life isn't as good or yeah, I feel like it kind of creates a false reality. It has definitely affected me and my mental health to the point where I actually deleted Instagram a couple years ago just because it like made me really insecure just like seeing everyone else's pictures and like how they didn't show any flaws. And yeah, it definitely has helped me to just become more confident, you know. Following the 60 Minutes segment with Francis Hugan, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp all went down, which lasted several hours. Some speculate it was Facebook trying to cover up the allegations, though there is no proof of this. Later that day, Facebook and its affiliated companies released a statement saying a cascade of mistakes made during maintenance on Facebook's network caused the outage that took several servers offline. Thanks for watching. With winter around the corner, the last chance to do outdoor activities like apple picking are coming to an end. Many people have been spending the remaining fall days at Park Hill Orchard to enjoy local art exhibits at Art in the Park and go apple picking with friends and family. Today we came to Park Hill Orchard in East Hampton to take a closer look at the Art in the Park experience and the history behind Park Hill Orchard. Uh, what makes Art in the Orchard special is that it is an outdoor large sculpture exhibition. Uh, it's held on a working fruit farm. Um, it allows families to come out and spend the afternoon in the country on a farm when they wouldn't maybe normally do that. And it's, uh, it's very good for children as well as artists as well as parents. Everybody um, is it's on a very large area, so people are, are well spaced out, and um, it, it, uh, it's a great way to spend an entire afternoon outside. Um, we also have apple picking here, which probably doesn't take as long as the sculpture uh, trail, so, um, so it, it's a great uh, combination of activities to pick apples and then uh, spend a few hours with your, with your family on the, uh, on the art trail itself. My favorite, I mean, I like them all. Of course, I have to say that. 
I like uh, I like some of the more natural things that are made from wood, maybe with hand tools, that type of thing. Um, there's an artist which we're going to feature next year in our invitational sculpture show named Fenwick from Guilford, Vermont. Um, if there is such a thing as a diamond in the rough, he's the diamond in the rough that we found in our decade or more of doing these art shows. Um, the driftwood sculptures are always really nice. There's a giraffe this year. Uh, Lindsay uh, won a spot in the last biennial with a, a full-size elephant made of driftwood and her, and her child. Um, there's a beautiful uh, poppy garden, which is actually crocheted poppies, 3,200 of them that a woman uh, made over, over the COVID lockdown and uh, stitched them all together. Uh, so there's, there's really some nice uh, pieces here. Everyone should come out and look at them and, and see what your favorite is. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week. Hello, NHS. I'm Larry Armstrong. And I'm Nola Buzanski. You probably know us as the hosts of Taking It to the Streets, the best transcript segment out there. But what you might not know is that we are very invested in local politics, so much so that we are launching, launching our, our campaign, campaign for, for co-mayor of NHS. Now you might be asking yourself, why should I vote for you? Great question. If you vote for us, we promise to make NHS a healthier place. Once we are elected, we will restock the vending machines with your favorite fruits and vegetables. Such as the delicious cheetah spotted banana. Mmm. We will also cancel all the football games. They're just too dang rowdy. Lastly, we will enforce everyday fire drills. Only these ones will be real fires. This way, you will actually be able to feel how you would during a real fire. I support Nola and Levi for co-mayor of Northampton High School. I support Nola and Levi for mayors of NHS. I support Nola for mayor of NHS, not Levi, not Levi. Make sure to vote for Levi and Nola so we can make your dreams come true. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week. <laughs>